So everybody to please be on mute. We go live in 30 seconds now. We are live. Good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, on behalf of uh, President of All India Ophthalmic Society, Dr. Mahipal Sachdev, and Honorary General Secretary, Dr. Namrata Sharma, I would like to welcome to this webinar, which is just going to be discussing a very important topic. This topic has become uh, particularly important in view of growing concern about antimicrobial resistance. And we as ophthalmologists are not untouched by this menace. I am sure that all of you will uh, enjoy this uh, 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 webinar and will learn a great deal about the problem of antimicrobial resistance, how do we deal with it, and what is the value of uh, a newer molecules that are coming in the market, including a higher strength levofloxacin, which is 1.5%. Uh, we are very fortunate uh, to have a wonderful uh, 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 list of speakers. Uh, I am Prashant Garg, and I'll be giving you an overview of uh, the problem of antimicrobial resistance. Uh, uh, I'll be followed by Dr. Radhika Tandon, uh, professor at uh, the Rajendra Prasad I Institute at All India Institute of Medical Sciences. Uh, she will be talking about the pharmacokinetics and how we can use these pharmacokinetic principles uh, for the best utilization of anti antimicrobial agents. Uh, Dr. Sujata Mohan from Chennai, uh, she will be talking about the value of uh, corneal scraping in the, in the diagnosis and appropriate management of uh, uh, corneal infection. We also have Professor Shigoro Kinoshita from Kyoto Perfectual University. Um, uh, I like to thank on behalf of All India Ophthalmic Society uh, for Professor Kinoshita to spare time uh, on the Sunday and giving his perspective <laughs> on the value of 1.5% levofloxacin and his his experience. Uh, Dr. Namrata Sharma will be joining shortly and she will be speaking on newer paradigms in the management of bacterial keratitis. And then uh, uh, Dr. Nikhil Gokhale will be talking to us about his experience of using 1.5% levofloxacin. So without an undue, uh, let me begin my talk about the perspective of uh, 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 antimicrobial resistance. The objective of my talk will be to present to you important challenges in the management of corneal ulcer. I will then talk to you about antimicrobial resistance and ocular infections, particularly talking about does in vitro antimicrobial he was denied treatment to inaccurate PR and explain the process. There is a background noise. Does it translate into treatment failure? And then how do we handle antimicrobial resistance, especially what is the value of fortified drops? Let me begin with this uh, set of pictures from patients of corneal ulcer. If you carefully look at these pictures, I'm sure all of you will ask this question. Can we treat all of these cases using the same strategy of management, especially the same set of drugs? I'm sure your answer will be no, because cases of corneal ulcers are caused by a variety of microorganisms, which vary from bacteria to fungi, parasites, viruses, and in some cases, a uh, uh, corneal ulcer may be caused by immunological phenomena 
which is unrelated to any microorganism. And we are also aware of that there is no single drug or a combination that can take care of all of these organisms. And this is our first challenge in the management of corneal infection. We must therefore identify the causative microorganism. And typically this is done by a detailed microbiology workup, which comprises of uh, uh, taking sample using chimeras, a spatula or 15 number surgical blade and examining this specimen under microscope using variety of staining technique, as well as inoculating it on variety of culture media that facilitate growth of bacteria, fungi and parasites. For example, this patient um, on scraping showed gram positive cocci and on blood agar showed a beta hemolytic growth and therefore, it was easy to pick up the right kind of antimicrobial for the management of this case. But the problem is not that simple. Let us look at this patient of 20 year female who presented with two days uh, symptoms uh, following contact lens wear. And she used to sleep with the contact lenses on. I'm sure with this history, it will be very obvious uh, what is the causative organism for this case. But the question that comes to our mind is, will you treat this patient of contact lens related microbial keratitis using the same set of antibiotic as uh, my previous case caused by beta hemolytic uh, gram positive cocci? I am sure there will be a confusion as to which antibiotic to pick up uh, for a starting treatment of these cases. And that is not going to be similar in both the cases because there is relative selective activity of antibiotics against particular class of bacteria. For example, cefazolin, vancomycin, chloramphenicol, and fourth generation fluoroquinolones have better activity against gram positive organism whereas aminoglycosides and first generation fluoroquinolones have much superior activity for gram negative organisms. In addition, we are also aware of that antibiotics act by different mechanisms of action. And therefore, if you are using a combination of antibiotic, you must be familiar with uh, the mechanism of action. It is therefore very clear that even when we are aware of the kind of bacteria, we should also be familiar with the antibiotics and their selective activity or preferential activity. That will help us uh, pick up the first antibiotic to start treatment with in patients with corneal ulceration. And this is a second challenge that we face in the management of corneal ulcer. If you think that these are only the challenges. Let me show you this third patient of 50 year female who presented to us with the seven days symptoms. She was being treated with moxifloxacin 0.5% every one hourly and atropine sulfate once a day. But despite this treatment, her condition deteriorated over a period of time. When she presented to us, we started treatment uh, uh, based on microbiology. The microbiology revealed gram-positive cocci in pairs and the antibiotic susceptibility of the growth, which was identified as the staph aureus, showed that the patient or the organisms were resistant to moxie, getty, and ofloxacin, but were susceptible to cefazolin. Therefore, it was obvious for us to pick up cefazolin as the antibiotic of choice. There is another case, 73 year female who presented to us with the history of 15 days duration. She was treated with basifloxacin 0.6% eight times per day. But despite this medical treatment, her condition deteriorated and she developed a limbus to limbus infiltrate. Her microbiology revealed gram negative bacilli and the growth was identified as Pseudomonas aeruginosa which was resistant to practically all classes of antibiotics except ceftazidine. So what we are talking about is that despite identifying organism, we still need to understand antibiotic susceptibility. And this is the third challenge in making a right choice of treatment in the management of corneal ulcer. 
So to, so to summarize, we discussed three sets of challenges in the management of corneal ulcer. One is that these are caused by variety of organism needing different classes of drugs. We also discussed that there are, the antibiotics have differential susceptibility and we are seeing a phenomena of antimicrobial resistance. What is this antimicrobial resistance and what are those super bugs? Antimicrobial resistance is defined as a phenomena wherein an organism become insensitive or is able to grow in the presence of a particular antibiotic or, or class of antibiotic and even multiple classes of antibiotics. And when they are resistant to multiple classes of antibiotics, they are labeled as superbugs. This phenomena was known right from the time penicillin was discovered. Alexander Fleming in his uh, article cautioned people uh, against misuse of, of this drug. But the enthusiasm of having a weapon in hand to take care of all infections resulted in display of these billboards on the streets of New York City and many parts of the world. We kept on misusing antibiotic and very soon we ended up with a situation where penicillins or the organisms became resistant to penicillin. It is not the story just of penicillin. Any class of antibiotic you look into uh, within five to seven years of their introduction in the market, they all showed some or greater degree of resistance. In a more recent uh, report from World Health Organization, uh, the, they, they found that five of the six WHO regions have reported resistance of 50% or more in hospital acquired infection. And three of the six WHO regions reported a resistance of 25% or more in community acquired infections. We also have now enough evidence that uh, the antibiotic resistance is no more a hospital acquired phenomenon. It is originating in community because not only of misuse of antibiotics in the community uh, for human beings, but also in animal, uh, 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 animal uh, uh, husbandry, poultry and agriculture, as well as because of the uh, uh, unregulated disposal of pharmacological waste in, in water. Why is then concern? The concern is because while we are entering into the era of antibiotic resistance, we are seeing an innovation gap. We are not bringing out any new antibiotic. And very soon there is a fear that we will be entering in an era where to treat these super bugs, which is methicillin resistant, Staph aureus and carbapenem resistant, Enterobacteriaceae, we will be running out of option in managing these infections. So the question comes, is AMR a problem in ocular infections? I'll take you back in 1980, where the bacterial keratitis study comparing fluoroquinolone monotherapy with a combination of fortified cefazoline and tobramycin showed that monotherapy was as effective as combination therapy. Further, it was thought that fluoroquinolones develop resistance through, through genetic mutations. And therefore, people thought that we will not be seeing the phenomena of resistance on using the fluoroquinolones. In 1999, we published this report where we showed progressive increase of ciprofloxacin resistance uh, in Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Subsequently, many more uh, investigators published the reports of emerging fluoroquinolone resistance, not only in bacterial keratitis, but also endophthalmitis, conjunctivitis, and blepharitis. This led to introduction of 8-methoxy-6-fluoroquinolones in the market, and it was thought that these molecules have superior activity against quinolone-resistant isolates, and because they act by dual mechanisms, it was thought that they will have even reduced probability of developing drug resistance. And they were right. In 2002, when we looked at our isolates from our laboratory, we found that the MIC values were 
much much lower even against ciprofloxacin resistant gram positive cocci although for ciprofloxacin resistant gram negative organisms the mic was same as of ciprofloxacin now over 10 years period in 2010 when we revisited the susceptibility we found that both getty and moxifloxacin have lost considerable activity for cipro resistant staph aureus coagulase negative staph as well as streptococcus pneumoniae and that was worrying because despite our belief we saw a reduction in susceptibility we also published report of rising um incidence of methicillin resistance among gram positive organism including staph aureus and coagulase negative staphs and emergence of multi drug resistant pseudomonas in ocular infections more recently uh, a large multi centric trial sponsored by asia cornea society has published the results of what is called as asia cornea society infectious keratitis study this study was run over eight different countries where 12 study centers were were participating uh, with 27 uh, participating institution in phase 2 some more centers were added into the study the study was aimed to enroll 4000 patients but ended up enrolling more than 6500 patients what this study showed that in asia pacific region trauma and contact lens wear are the two most important predisposing factors but the distribution of these predisposing factors were different in different countries while trauma was the main predisposing factors in india china philippines and thailand contact lens wear was the most important predisposing factor in singapore japan taiwan and korea even the microbiology was very interesting while the fungi dominated the spectrum followed by gram positive bacteria and then gram negative bacteria the distribution of these organisms were different in different countries in india and china fungi were the most important causative organism whereas in singapore thailand and taiwan gram negative organisms were the predominant organism whereas Japan and Korea had predominantly infections by gram positive organisms the distribution of these organisms even among gram positive bacteria also showed a wide variability among different countries however for gram negative organisms pseudomonas aeruginosa was the predominant gram negative organisms in in practically all the participating countries now what was antibiotic susceptibility data showed that countries like india philippines and china have much higher prevalence of antimicrobial resistance as compared to singapore thailand japan even here it was noticed that uh, in india and china many of the isolates of pseudomonas aeruginosa were resistant to multiple classes of antibiotics similar studies have also been published from united states as antimicrobial surveillance the first one was the surveillance network followed by ocular trust study and more recently in the month of march 2020 um, the armor study results have also been published you may ask a question that when we are instilling drop directly to the site of infection we achieve very high concentration that lead to rapid control of infection and therefore we see very high percentage of cure despite uh, what is known as the antimicrobial resistance and you are right the in vitro susceptibility tests have several disadvantages particularly one that you must know is that the cut off for susceptibility determinations are based on the serum concentration and we do not have any data on the on the cut off values of susceptibility based on ocular concentrations but despite these limitations i have shown you through these two cases that amr is a problem in vivo and lead to treatment failure in some cases there are also now evidences that prophylactic use of antibiotic especially if these are used repeatedly 
can also result in colonization of eye as well as nasopharynx with drug resistant organisms. Uh, this study clearly showed that from fourth visit onward, the nasopharynx of patient receiving repeated uh, profile access uh, was uh, colonized by drug resistant organisms. So it will be important for all of us to understand the principles on which to manage this menace of antimicrobial resistance. The way forward will be to summarize, know your enemy through microbiology workup, become familiar with the weapons that you have, that is the antibiotics that we commonly use in the management of and susceptibility in your region. This can be best described by using MIC-90 which is antibiotic concentration that inhibits the growth of 90% bacteria. For example, for Mycobacterium shiloni, when we determined MIC-90, we found that azithromycin and clarithromycin, closely followed by amikacin, have the lowest MIC-90 value. And therefore, we treat all the patients of mycobacteria or atypical mycobacteria using amikacin. You can use percentage susceptibility data as well. For example, in a more recent paper that we published, we found that moxifloxacin has developed, uh, or 82% of the isolate we included in the study showed resistance to moxifloxacin, whereas uh, the level of resistance was much lower for ciprofloxacin, gatifloxacin, and levofloxacin. Similar results were shown in the A6 study. The pooled data showed that moxifloxacin has a higher level of resistance as compared to cipro, levo, and catifloxacin. We can also use smart strategies and which will be discussed by Dr. Radhika Tandon in, his, in her talk. In summary, what we want to achieve is a concentration above mutation prevention, which lead to not only killing the susceptible organism, but as well as the resistant organism. And here is probably the value of fortified antibiotics, including levofloxacin 1.5%, which is dispensed in three times the concentration in, in com and other commercial formulations. So to conclude, through this talk, we have tried to give you a perspective of my challenges posed by microbial keratitis. I touched upon the AMR, which is currently a serious problem, not just in systemic infection, but ocular infection, and the need for a multi-pronged approach to tackle these challenges. As a physician, we must become familiar with the rationale use of antimicrobials. Thank you very much. With this, I'll stop my screen sharing. I will now like to invite Dr. Radhika Tandon to talk about uh, the, the pharmacokinetics and pharmacological principles that we can use to tackle AMR. Radhika, over to you. Thank you Dr. Prashant, and uh, good morning, everyone. I'm grateful to AIOS for giving me the opportunity to take part in this important webinar. And with that background given by Dr. Prashant, uh, I will take the story forward, uh, giving you the basics of um, the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics and the uh, lab-based principles which one should understand in proper selection of the antibiotic for to treat our ocular infections. So I'm going to cover the basic aspects linking the lab information with the clinical approach. So um, this is a, a, a situation that we encounter very commonly. We see all sorts of infections and who are the people who are going to prescribe and who will benefit from this webinar? They are the ophthalmologists. Uh, what are we talking about? So which antimicrobial agent uh, should we um, choose? And as Prashant has nicely said, it's very important to be aware of what is the global perspective, what is the entire armamentarium available to us, combined with your local information. And finally, it is your particular patient, how that patient has presented, what the patient has been through, what treatment has already been prescribed, so always take that time to look carefully at the past records and 
particularly inquire into the history and the response the patient has had to whatever medication has been given, because that can give you a clue in the current scenario where you may encounter patients as Prashant had shown, where they've already taken multiple antibiotics and they are not responding. Now, why uh, we choose a particular agent, as I said, there is a rationale, which is a basic background theoretical information combined with the clinical, uh, um, um, particular clinical patient or the clinical scenario that one encounters. And then how is it to be administered? So that, that is another uh, thing that we need to consider. Is it going to be topical? Is it going to be by local injection? as is the case uh, required for, say, endophthalmitis, where you have to give it intravitrally uh, uh, or even sometimes intracameral injections for uh, severe corneal ulcers and so on, and systemic. So these are all the things that the ophthalmologist has to take into concern. Basically, the goal is to eradicate the pathogens effectively with minimum toxicity and avoid selective buildup of resistant bugs. We do understand the concept of survival of the fittest and microorganisms are no different from the rest of us. So when they are um, invading a particular eye or an ocular tissue, and they are now being attacked by the antimicrobial agents, the ones which are stronger, they are going to uh, survive and then multiply having the full playing field to themselves when the others are all knocked out. So therefore, whatever agent you give has to be effective and um, uh, successful in eliminating all the organisms at one, one go as far as possible. So that is something which is important. And obviously, the level of seriousness will depend upon the level of involvement. Corneal ulcers are a very serious condition, similarly endophthalmitis. Whereas if you have a case of bacterial conjunctivitis, they are mild bacterial conjunctivitis, that is not the case to overload with a whole lot of our you know, uh, uh, um, most effective antibiotics. So you have to be very judicious to know what is the condition you're treating and how you're going to approach. So as I said, important considerations also, it's not just the antibiotic which is working, it is also the host defense mechanism. There is the inherent immunity of the host which may be compromised in conditions where the person may be diabetic, particularly uncontrolled diabetes mellitus. There may be autoimmune disorders, a patient may be immunosuppressed or on chemotherapy for systemic malignancies. Similarly, there may be local ocular pathology such as dry eye and um, they may have have already been on steroids for some other reason, or they may have been misuse of steroids. So all the host defense mechanisms also you have to take into consideration and not expect that your antibiotic is going to work uh, on its own. Of course, as I mentioned, the infected site will be taken into consideration. Then the virulence of the pathogen. One uh, 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 impression that you will get about the virulence of the pathogen is going to be on the clinical course. So uh, the usual standard workup and the, the, and the way the, 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 the infection is progressing, whether very rapidly deteriorating, the relentless progression of the lesion, et cetera, will help to give you a clue about the virulence. And then the antimicrobial agent is what you are going to provide to get rid of the inf uh, infective organism. You have to be aware of the pharmacological properties of the, or of the antibiotic that you're going to choose, its mode of action and its microbiological effects. Mode of action is important because you, if you're using combination therapy, you must make sure that the two are um, going to work um, uh, supporting each other and not one is going to block the effect of the other. So it's very important to have a, knowledge, a basic knowledge about the mode of action as well. Now, uh, generally, if you see, largely uh, uh, over the years, most people are um, uh, cognizant of the fact that if you have corneal ulcers, a corneal scraping is um, a very important a practical, uh, almost essential tool we, we would consider as corneal specialists. So generally speaking, if you do a corneal smear, you straight away will get some idea about which direction to take whether you identify gram-positive cocci, gram-negative, or you see a fung fungal organism. So that gives you a clue straight away. So here again, we uh, emphasize as corneal specialists that a corneal scraping should be done. So, uh, and uh, I know Sujatha is going to cover it later on. And uh, once you get uh, information or a clue about the organism on the basis of your corneal scraping, 
the, 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 the tendency or the preferred practice is to give a targeted antibiotic based on what you think is going to work most. So that is your empirical treatment. And then you will wait for the culture report and the clinical response to reassess or reevaluate after about 48 hours to decide now do you continue or do you change? So there are a whole host of um, literature available, different, different or, uh, organisms and different antibiotic spectrum. And as uh, you have understood by now, this is going to vary from place to place, country to country and situation to situation. So uh, largely uh, the, you, you need to know is it bacterial, fungal, viral, or parasitic. If it is bacterial, is it seeming to be gram positive and gram negative? And here again, despite your best clinical judgment, I would uh, suggest that you should rely on a smear to give you a more definitive direction. And then correspondingly, you would give, choose the antibiotic because as is very clear, the antibiotics are not uniformly effective against all organisms, even though they have broad spectrum coverage. So the properties to look for when choosing would of course be that you would choose an agent once you have a clue as to what is the organism you're dealing with, then you would like to choose the agent which has a stronger efficacy against that particular bug. It should be broad spectrum because you cannot be 100% confident that that is the exact agent. So therefore, in the, there may be simultaneous infection which may be latent. So you would like it to be effective against both gram positive and gram negative when you're choosing empirical therapy. And it has to have a very fast action. It should have a good safety profile. And this is something that we are now becoming more aware of that also one has to pay attention to the uh, the the, the, the possibility of the organism itself uh, uh, leading to greater resistance. So therefore, you would like to select antibiotics which have a low propensity to induce resistance in the bacteria or the microorganisms. So largely, fourth generation fluoroquinolones were a uh, certainly a great improvement in the nature of agents that we had. Uh, we, we knew that they had broad spectrum against largely both gram positive and gram negative uh, organisms. And as when they first came, uh, there was the very exciting idea that, that here we have an agent which is less prone to resistance. Of course, time has shown that this is not entirely true and there is an emerging resistance. And the other nice thing about uh, the introduction was that they were preservative free. Uh, particularly moxifloxacin. So this made it very attractive and it still remains a very attractive aspect of moxifloxacin uh, that it is preservative free. So generally, the shifting trends in bacterial keratitis in South Florida and emerging resistance to fluoroquinolones is just one of the uh, papers we started emerging in 2000, showing that actually there are um, organisms which are developing resistance to these so-called suspected or ex expected to be magical drugs. Now, um, talking about fortified combination therapy versus monotherapy here, this is again a very, very uh, still a kind of a debatable point. Um, the, the, the benefit of fortified combination therapy was that you are using two agents, uh, that they are freshly prepared and you're using them at very high concentration with the idea of getting rid of all the organisms straight away. But there are disadvantages. There is a high cost. And the other thing is there is a contamination risk. So this has to be prepared. And not everybody has access to a pharmacy which will prepare and dispense it. So largely, many ophthalmologists will just have to prepare it themselves. And it is compounded and they have a short shelf life, which again is a disadvantage because it's not very convenient often for the patients to come back every four to five days to get a fresh a bottle of the medications and sometimes they may just run out of it and they may not be able to come back in case there's some exigent circumstance and then they won't have anything to use. Uh, so this is something which happens in countries where there are long distances that the patient has to, tra to travel and so on. So definitely, if you have a commercially available product, which is prepared in a good manufacturing practice lab, properly bottled, labeled, etc., that that certainly is a, a big advantage. Um, cost effective in the long run, because uh, compared to the cost of purchasing the in, in injection and providing it, and the multiple times it has to be prepared, that can make a difference. The low risk of contamination is, is as expected, because it's a commercially prepared um, uh, uh, dispensed product, and it is commercially available, it has a better shelf life, and they do not require then refrigeration. 
So uh, largely, um, the, the, the general trend is um, that based on your uh, clinical judgment and your uh, smear report or purely on a clinical judgment, most ophthalmologists, even uh, corneal specialists will start on empirical therapy. However, whether it is going to be fluoroquinolone monotherapy or fortified antibiotics depends a lar largely on the nature of your clinical practice and what is your experience. And this is the importance of knowing what is the general uh, profile of organisms in your region. So, um, it's, we, we, it seems very skeptical that monotherapy could work when you're so used to using a combination drug, but it is very important because of all the reasons cited before to gather evidence uh, in a systematic uh, randomized controlled trial, whether uh, what we think and what we feel is actually translates into actual practice. So we did find that it is indeed true that monotherapy works because um, the importance was to find out the scenarios where monotherapy should be recommended. Uh, however, in the course of our clinical experience, uh, so one is that you have a randomized controlled trial where, where you have selection criteria and everything is done in a perfect way. But at the same time, we have patients walking into the clinic who have already been on treatment before. So we also looked at our data, a retrospective analysis of patients who are not in the trial. And we found that largely the in vitro susceptibility of bacterial keratitis isolates to four generation fluoroquinolones was reasonably good in 2010. However, even then we did found there was an emerging resistance of pseudomonas um, uh, to both moxifloxacin and gatifloxacin. Uh, now, in as uh, late as 2020, we have another publication on the value of fortified aminoglycosides, cephalosporin and dobramycin as first line treatment and in fluoroquinolone resistant bacterial uh, keratitis. And you will find that often you will have a cycle. Just as in the fashion world, you will have a cycle in the kind of clothes people wear and after 10 years, the old fashion will come back. So similarly, in this way also, you'll find that there will be a cycle, there'll be emerging resistance and after a period of 10 to 15 years, you'll find that the organisms are now sensitive to the, back, to, the, to the agents which were not used for several years. So this is again, highlighting that a lot depends upon what is the prevalent um, rate of infection, what is the prevalent susceptibility Acceptability and or the, the bacteria, the sorry, the antibiotics which have not been used for some time, the bacteria do not have a memory and they forget that they, uh, the, whatever mechanisms they had to be resistant to them and they can be effective again. So therefore, in this study also in 2020, it did found that a large number of um, patients who were fluoroquinolone resistant uh, um, bacterial keratitis, they were sensitive to using fortified antibiotic. However, the, um, they, they had found that several patients, they have also uh, reported that several patients were susceptible to the monotherapy in their past experience. So now looking at uh, um, the, the, the scenario in India, if you see the susceptibility and resistance, there is a general rising resistance of pseudomonas to the currently largely used fluoro fluoroquinolones, catifloxacin and moxifloxacin. And similarly, there is a rising resistance to staph aureus as well. This has been seen um, in different parts of the country. And uh, the, the, this particular study is... Um, uh, from uh, the LB Prasad group and a trend analysis of eight years, Dr. Savitri Sharma um, needs no introduction. And a very nice reliable data has shown that there is a very, very big serious concern that we all need to be aware of. Similarly, uh, data from Delhi where uh, I am and where I practice here again, we have uh, a study from uh, Shroff Eye Institute and here they have found um, uh, similar what we expect that there is an increasing resistance. And I'd like to highlight here that gatifloxacin resistance, if you see, to pseudomonas, again, is, is showing as an emerging problem. And similarly with moxifloxacin. So uh, now what do we do about it? How do we understand and uh, how do we select it? So one is, as we see, we look at the current susceptibility pattern. The other thing is that we go by the actual objective values. Uh, to, to know as a starting point. So typically we have been relying on minimum inhibitory concentration values. And as uh, we want to go higher and higher, we can take the MIC 50 and the MIC 90. So that's one. But uh, there are certain limitations of purely relying on MIC data because this is effectively the potency in vitro. 
and there are many other factors which may come into play in the host tissue as i will explain later on secondly uh, the mic value may be high but it is how effective and how quickly it eliminates the organism that is something which is not defined by this data and that is something which we need to look at because the longer you allow the antibiotic to be available at a lower value and you have those um, uh, highly powerful bugs who are uh, you know survival of the fittest ones and they may then develop have more time to get exposed to the antibiotic and develop the mechanisms to have resistance and then proliferate um, in the absence of any other competition so what else can we do we would look at the agent obviously we would see the one which we expect to be the most susceptible then we'd look at the root uh, as i said if something is you feel the topical drops are not going to reach then you will have to give it directly by intracameral or intralateral injection for endothelial mitosis and so on and then the other thing is that you can also try to increase the concentration or the dose the amount of drug that you're delivering so one is the concentration and the other is the frequency so this is a, a, the, the other thing that we have in our hands so there's basically a tripartite relationship you have the antimicrobial drug which is going to work on the bacteria and the, if the the mechanism or the in relationship between the org, the organism and the way it's killed by the antimicrobial agent is the pharmacodynamics there's the bacteria which are interplaying with the host there's the infection and the host will try to counteract by its own defense mechanism and the antimicrobial agents interplay with the host the host will be using its pharmacokinetics the tear flow and the way that the anti uh, antibiotic is removed from the body and the antimicrobial will affect the host by toxicity so these are this is the tripartite relationship which is very dynamic and it will change from person to person and from organism to organism and agent to agent now looking at the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics the principle to determine the antibacterial efficacy we have to understand that as far as pharmacokinetics are concerned we are we were worried about how much time or how well or effectively the antibiotic is available at the site of action so uh, as you can see it will determine upon how the con maximum concentration is reached how long the maximum concent how much time it takes to achieve the maximum concentration as tmax and how long it's going to remain as shown by the half life and the area under the curve and the pharmacodynamics is the effect of the antibiotic on the organism which will depend upon the biological and therapeutic effect it should have a broad spectrum so it kills all the organisms and uh, it should have a low potency to develop resistance so it is a low mutation um, supportive action and then we can look at the mic 90 rather than the um, mic 50 and we can also look at the mutation prevention concentration so these are a lot of um, further value to take into consideration but this is important to understand and in selecting the antibiotic more objectively and scientifically so now just to show you uh, the same the similar concept uh, by means of a graph so you have an antibiotic which has been provided it's been delivered and you want to make sure that the amount or the strength of the antibiotic available at the site of action is more than the minimum inhibitory concentration secondly it has been confirmed that if you have a better concentration a higher concentration there is a higher rate of killing and we want to kill the organisms fast so we want to have a quick rise to the peak we want that high concentration to be maintained for a longer time so we like to see the time for which the the strength is more than the minimum inhibitory concentration we want to look at the area under the curve for which the concentration is available higher than the, than the mic that is the effective concentration and so we can also look at the aoc mic ratio maximizing the amount of the drug received and making sure that its duration of action and availability is prolonged adequately here again as you can see that the tendency for gram negative organisms to be resistant or be less susceptible to the fluoroquinolones is a concern because this ratio is more than 125 for gram negative organisms and more than 30 for gram positive organisms so if your smear shows that it is a gram positive organism and uh, if it's a gram negative organism and you decide to start with a, a fourth generation fluoroquinolone you should not assume that this is going to be 
absolutely fine. You have to reassess after 48 hours, check your culture report and check the clinical response and then proceed to decide what to do further. So this is the principle you want to maximize the concentration to get the maximal therapeutic efficacy and enhanced area under the curve to the MIC ratio will, it will tell you the therapeutic efficacy of the antibiotic and an enhanced concentration versus MIC ratio is going to determine the suppression of acquisition of resistance. And this is what we want in our ideal antibiotic. So just to, to make it more simple, to make you have you would like to maximize the antibiotic concentration. And as I mentioned earlier, apart from the agent uh, and the, the method of the administration, we do have a handle on the dose. The dose could be just given every half hourly or one hourly, or also we could increase the concentration, that is the amount per drop. So you will maximize the tissue concentration, maximize the therapeutic efficacy, and by killing as many organisms as possible, preferably all, you will minimize the emergence of resistance strains. So when you come to this concept of maximizing antibiotic concentration, apart from the fortified antibiotics, which is a concept which has been there for decades, that you do not use a normal concentration, you will use fortified antibiotics. But for commercially available, um, the two um, uh, agents where this strategy has been used is with gatifloxacin and levofloxacin. So this is something which, um, which is another uh, attempt to provide something uh, from a commercial perspective or a readily available perspective, rather than relying on the ophthalmologist to start, you know, compiling and, and making up the antibiotic on their own. So certainly we would prefer to have a ready-made drug, uh, which you can use effectively. But uh, until we get um, that product, uh, we, 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 we have to keep the balance whether to use the fortified versus the commercially available. So summary, I would say that drug resistance is an inevitable consequence of irrational antibiotic use. And though we may say that it is terrible, et cetera, et cetera, it is something that we have to stay with. It's no way that the ophthalmologists are going to be able to change the entire community. There are so many people are involved, so many different disciplines and the general public also. So we have to accept that there is going to be widespread use of antibiotics, no matter what we say, no matter how much the media screams about it, but drug resistance is, uh, there is going to be irrational antibiotic and drug resistance is an inevitable consequence. It is better we go for a smart solution to get rid of the organism and minimize drug resistance by the weapons in our hand. So therefore, as I said, you take it for, uh, for granted that bacterial resistance to fluoroquinolones is there and it's going to get worse. We have to have broad spectrum coverage and make sure uh, we use the best agent most effectively, use the more potent antibiotic formulations with the lower propensity for development of emerging resistance. Uh, we can look more at the pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic theory supplements uh, with topical uh, antibiotics, as, we, as you correctly know, if you have a foconyl ulcer which is not responding, we even do an intrastromal injection. That's one example. And the efficacy of fluoroquinolones improves with higher concentration and better tissue availability. This is also for sure. So with this background, I would like to say that um, one has to do, have a judicious combination of uh, academic knowledge, practical experience and the information available by uh, established studies to, 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 to decide which antibiotic to choose. And uh, we look forward to the rest of the lectures because that is going to give you a more um, practical um, and also a better data proven uh, information to make an informed choice. Thank you. Thank you. Uh... Radhika for a wonderful overview of various pharmacokinetic principles um, and, and, and basically highlighting the value of fortified drops in the management of infections. Uh, the next talk will be by Dr. Sujata Mohan. Um, she will be talking about corneal scraping, essential tools uh, complementing empirical anti-infective treatment. Over to you, Dr. Mohan. At the outset, I'd like to thank AOS for uh, giving me this opportunity to take part in this wonderful webinar. So my talk is going to go back a little and uh, uh, tell the importance of corneal scraping. So why is corneal scraping important? 
So we may have a very clear patient history and we can have a clinical characteristics of the ulcer. Making an empirical diagnosis is objective. So we need to have a subjective uh, proof that what type of organism you're dealing with. So the, very important to have the corneal stains and cultures to identify the what type of organism. And the antibiogram also allows us to tailor the treatment based on the sensitivity of the organism. So corneal scraping is the most valuable specimen in case of corneal ulcer and its examination is a mainstay in the diagnosis and subsequent management. So the instruments used for scraping are uh, normally what we use is Kimura spatula, a 26 gauge needle, which has to be handled very carefully. You can use a hypodermic needle, Bart Parker blade, surgical blade number 15 is probably my choice of uh, instrument to, for scraping. A calcium alginate swab or a platinum sp uh, spatula, which has got a rounded flexible tip can also be used. The prerequisites are that the patient has to be seated on a slit lamp. A wire speculum is optional. Procrocaine is the common an anesthetic used is because it is uh, the least bacteriostatic and use a 15 number blade and a Bart Parker blade. So three glass slides we need. We need a grams, one for gram stain, one for KOH wet mount. And in, you can have an additional gla uh, glass slide if you're suspecting um, atypical macrobacteria or um, a cacoflor white stain for acanthine bubble and so on. So culture plates, which are commonly used are blood agar, chocolate agar, and saburut's uh, dextrose agar. And other optional plates uh, may include a non-nutrient agar with the escherichia overlay, theomartin medium, and uh, thioglycolate agar if you're suspecting other organisms. So there are some situations where we may be uh, finding it difficult to uh, obtain the samples for corneal scraping. These are very small corneal ulcers, as you can see in the left uh, photograph. They are less than two millimeters, sometimes maybe very difficult to get any uh, specimen. Probably you can uh, just get one and just use it uh, to, for staining, probably doing a gram stain alone, uh, if you're very particular about this, or you can start on an empirical treatment. In patients with non-separative keratitis, that is um, uh, without uh, any sign of infection, uh, 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 scraping is not indicated. If you do scrape, you might uh, find that you don't have any specimen. In advanced keret uh, keratitis with severe keratolysis and desmentoseal, you have to be very careful about scraping. And even if you uh, scrape, you might just get some necrotic tissue and may not get any specimen. And cases with deep stromal keratitis, which no access to, uh, 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 to the instrument, uh, again, getting a, uh, scraping, any uh, valuable scraping would be very difficult and you need to assort to different methods for collecting the specimen. In patients with intact epithelium, a debridement of epithelium is often required before uh, we collect the specimen. So a uh, role of corneal scraping is very important to first to facilitate the uh, diagnosis. And uh, it's important uh, to uh, scrape the active edge and not the base of the ulcer because most often the base contains only the slough except in certain organisms where underlying the base, you can still have some active organism growing, but majority of the active uh, uh, ulceration uh, so that you have to collect it only from the edge of the ulcer. And that will give us the maximum uh, information. So in patients uh, who have very deep seated ulcers, as you can see here, the problem is to access this uh, infiltrate. And what we can do is we can pass a uh, braided suture such as an 80 silk through the uh, infection and uh, the corrugated, uh, uh, the nature of the suture can catch on some of the infiltrates. And this can be cut into small uh, bits and it can be inoculated on uh, different media. So that will give us an idea about um, uh, whether we are going in the right uh, direction. Again, uh, having only an endothelial plaque such as this, you know, when you have a large endothelial plaque and the uh, overlying cornea is, uh, um, is clear, then you can do uh, a paracentesis through, uh, um, through the limbus using a 30 gauge or a 26 gauge needle. Either you can scrape or aspirate the endothelial plaque and which can be inoculated or uh, which can be stained and uh, to uh, come to a, uh, a conclusion about what type of organism we are dealing with. The other important thing is doing an incision biopsy, particularly in large ulcers where you're not able to access them because of the overlying epithelium or you're very deep seated. Doing a, a corneal punch using a skin biopsy uh, to find such as which is about two millimeters. It has to be done at multiple points. And uh, again, at the active uh, where the peripheral edge of the ulcer, which is actively growing. And it's important to include a portion of the area of the uninvolved cornea as well. 
or you can use a leaven number a blade which is slightly sharper um, but it has to be done under the microscope where you can take the patient to, uh, to the operation micro, uh, operation theater and you can do a, a deep seated uh, biopsy uh, carefully uh, without uh, perforation Uh, the next uh, uh, possibility is having a posterior lamella infiltrate. So you, here, here you can uh, approach the ulcer by doing, uh, doing a lamella flap, which can uh, help us to access the infiltrate. And then you can, once you've got uh, uh, the specimen, you can put the flap back and suture it. And uh, the other thing that we can do is very large ulcers such as this, and which has been under treatment for quite a while, which is uh, not responding to tre uh, treatment and is really uh, uh, reclarescent. Then these patients can have an excision biopsy. And this uh, ulcer is quite shallow, so we can just excise the, the top portion of the ulcer and uh, do an excision biopsy of the cornea. The advantage is that, so the, there'll be better penetration of the uh, drugs, antibiotics that we are uh, using. And the other thing is that because there's a lot of slough which can block the uh, penetration of the antibiotic by removing it, that also again uh, gives a better uh, chance for uh, the uh, ulcer to heal. And debulking the infection itself, when you remove about 90% of the infection, the, the, uh, the antibiotics will definitely work much better. So doing an excision biopsy in these even shallow and but large ulcers, which are um, uh, probably uh, going towards the uh, limbus, is uh, suggested. In patients with uh, very deep ulcers, which are uh, again, um, quite large, you can do a, a DALC, something like a near total DALC, which is a manual DALC. And uh, this can uh, debulk the infection and allow us to uh, treat the patient. And also gives us a better microbiological uh, diagnosis because we, can, we have more specimen to uh, work with and we can have more stains and um, smears done and cultures done. So we'll, uh, we can deal with this even if there is a recurrence of infection after the manual dance. And um, so the uh, role of corneal scraping is not only for diagnosis, but also to support medical therapy because it reduces the organism load and the superficial keratectomy and also exposes the organism to the uh, direct uh, antimicrobials that we're using. This is a small video showing um, how the scraping is done. It's always important to, to use the same direction. There's a very small ulcer. You can see that I'm scraping the periphery and use another blade to, you, uh, to take the, uh, uh, the next site for inoculation. So uh, it's important that you don't uh, use the same blade because you will be re-inoculating or you may accidentally inoculate in another area and uh, scrape in the same direction, don't use multiple direction and always the periphery of the ulcer, the active edge of the ulcer should be scraped. So smear preparation can be done uh, uh, once a, a 15 number blade is, uh, uh, the ulcer is scraped, it's transferred to a glass line and the marking is done uh, with a wax pencil to identify the area of the smear. Two slides are normally prepared, one for gram stain and one for K-weight stain. And uh, like I told you before, if you're suspecting something uh, other than a bacteria or a fungus, then you can do additional stains. So this is a uh, one which is showing the fusidium on a lactophenol blue uh, cotton stain. So um, difficulties with gram stain are uh, the number of organism and it is very low. We may not be able to identify the organism. Gram negative organisms, because they are decolorized, may be very difficult to identify, particularly when you have a very low uh, sample. And uh, improper decolorization deposits in the gram stain or um, precipitates on the, uh, on the gentian violet can also cause some confusion in uh, looking at the gram stain. It's also important to understand that this uh, stain can be contaminated due to repeated usage and fungus can grow. So it's important to uh, take that into consideration as well when you're having a fungal uh, uh, growth scene in a, uh, a patient with the uh, possibility of a bacterial infection. Um, so negative smears are, uh, can, be, uh, uh, can be seen in patients who have already been treated elsewhere or uh, who have already been treated with antimicrobial agents or when there is a mechanical damage to the cell wall, when there is uh, insufficient sample which is acquired, like in very small ulcers where you may not be able to get, or deep-seated ulcers when you're not able to get enough sample and you see only epithelial cells. Poor staining techniques as well and excessive heat fixation, and also the failure to uh, take the uh, trouble of examining the whole slide, you may still, uh, which may still have some uh, positive uh, areas. 
So interpretation of uh, culture results, probably culture is a gold standard for the diagnosis of uh, microbial keratitis. And the routine used uh, culture media, blood agar, chocolate agar, and saborodes dextrose agar, and anaerobic media if anaerobes are suspected. So the selective media is uh, are inoculated by streaking the spatula very lightly over the surface. That's very important because if you go deep seated, then these aerobic organisms may not grow. So you have to do a very light streak. And the usual uh, C-shaped mark is a common configuration which is used. So because this helps to differentiate uh, between a contaminant and an actual growth. And fresh samples have to be taken. So every time that you, uh, you're you inoculating, you have to take a new blade and uh, use a new um, uh, area to uh, scrape and streak. So criteria for positive culture are clinical signs of keratitis uh, with uh, one of the following, growth of organism in one or two media, confluent growth of the same pathogen in just one solid medium, a growth of uh, organism in a liquid as well as in a solid media. The Jones criteria for positive culture indicates that clinical infection in the presence of an isolation of bacteria, which have more than 10 or more colonies in one solid medium, an additional medium, and an isolation of fungi on any two media, and one medium in the presence of a positive sphere. Liquid media are highly sensitive, but less specific in demonstrating the organism as it's very difficult to, difficult to quantify the growth in the broth. So negative cultures can be had in patients with sterile non-infectious ulcers, uh, partial antibiotic therapy, inadequate sampling methods, an imp improper selection of media and incubation conditions, and again, a false interpretation of data. So in negative cultures, and if you want to rescript the patients not responding to empirical antibiotic, antibiotics have to be stopped at least 24 hours before rescraping is done. A PCR has an advantage of a greater speed than culture method. That is in about four hours, we get the results, but the disadvantage includes a cost and the high rate of false positivity. So anaerobic bacteria can be suspected in patients who have a pleomorphic slender or fusiform pathology on gram stain. When its growth is seen in the anaerobic uh, uh, zone of the liquid medium within the depth of the solid agar, presence of gas on the liquid media and failure to grow an organism in aerobic media despite organism detection in gram stain. So these are the some of the special stains such as GMSA, which is used for Chlamydial infections, uh, acid fast stain is used for atypical mycobacteria, hecofluor white is used for nocardia as well as for fungus, acidin orange is used for acanthamoeba and fungus as well as in bacteria, and a, a GMS stain is used for fungus as well as uh, lactophenol cotton blue stains. So the role of corneal scraping, uh, in addition to diagnostics, also to uh, support medical therapy to, to aid penetration, and particularly in fungal infection, when there is a growth of uh, um, uh, growth of epithelium, it's important to do scraping at least once in two days to allow penetration of the drug, and also it's important to remove the slough from the base of the ulcer to allow uh, penetration of the drug. And now with the role of uh, Pax CXL in patients with a, a recalcitrant infection. This has a role in, uh, um, the scraping has a role in first removing the uh, slough from the base of the ulcer and to reduce the organism load and also follow it up with a pack CXL if required. In patients who have advanced uh, ulcers with uh, impending uh, perforation or desmetose, a scraping of the a slough of the ulcer as well as the um, uh, creating a dry area around the ulcer is important before we uh, subject the patient to a cyanoacrylate glow. Air is injected into the anterior chamber if there is a complete perforation and cyanoacrylate glue is applied. If you apply the glue on top of a, a necrotic stuff, then it can fall off. So it's important to create a nice base for the glue to sit in so that uh, it produces a tectonic integrity that is required uh, uh, in patients with very thin corneas. So this is one of the patients who had a pseudomonas corneal ulcer and uh, was uh, had a desmetoseal and underwent a glue. So this is one of the studies I would like to quote, which is uh, published from L.V. Prasad I Institute in Cornea, where they evaluated the corneal scraping uh, of both uh, bacterial and fungal keratitis. In bacterial keratitis, they took corneal scrapings from 251 patients in early keratitis and 8, 841 from advanced keratitis. And in fungal corneal ulcers, they did quavoage and the cocofluor white stain in 114 patients with early keratitis and 363 with advanced keratitis. And they found the sensitivity of gram stain in the detection of bacteria was only 36% in early and 40% in advanced keratitis. However, the specificity was higher of 84 and 87% respectively. 
Comparatively, the sensitivity and specificity of fungal detection was much higher in KOH as well as uh, cocofluor white stains, 61 and 89 percent respectively, as well as in advanced keratitis. So the predictive values were higher for fungal detection than for gram stain, uh, uh, or that is for bacterial detection. So this is a chart showing how the specificity and sensitivity was much higher in fungal uh, uh, detection than in uh, bacterial detection. So these are some of the cases uh, that we've come across. This is a patient with a contact lens and, uh, induced keratitis in 30 year old showing a gram negative uh, bacilli with a pseudomonas growth on blood agar and showing an excellent response to the, uh, uh, the antimicrobial uh, which was used for this patient. And this patient uh, is a patient who had a DSEC and developed a chronic endophthalmitis. And vitreous biopsy uh, show, uh, uh, on uh, Sabura Zaga showed candida albicans, which is stained here on gram stain. So the patient underwent a vitrectomy followed by a replacement of the graft and a, a penetrating keratoplasty has been done. And the patient has uh, responded well to treatment and is uh, uh, free of infection for the past six months. So this is a patient who had uh, um, steroids for a small uh, irritation in the eye and developed, came with a fungal uh, corneal ulcer, and uh, which was proven by the LPCB strain, as well as fusarium, which is grown on the subrods dextrose agra. And after antifungal treatment, the patient has uh, healed very nicely. So this is again a patient who had an issue of injury with a cow's tail. Uh, you can see the septate in the KOH stain and uh, the, fuse, the aspergillus fumigators on the subrods agar. This is a gram positive infection of a patient who had an SICS and the suture, the retained suture, which developed a gram positive abscess and scraping found the gram positive cocci and uh, responded to moxifloxacin. So caveats in microbiological intervention are small ulcers can be treated with prospectum antibiotic. Large bacterial ulcers with negative stain are, uh, started on empirical antibiotics as gram stain as low specificity and sensitivity until the culture yields a positive result. In case of fungal ulcers, it is uh, uh, it's important that until unless it is proven to be fungal, we should not uh, start them on any uh, antifungals. So they can be started on empirical antibiotic and then wait for the culture results to uh, come up. But you cannot start patients with uh, clinical um, uh, evidence of fungal ulcer, which is not showing up a KOH positive because the study very clearly states that the both specificity and sensitivity of uh, um, uh, KOH and cocofluor white stain is of significant value in uh, fungal detection. So direct smear examination is of more value for immediate onset of treatment, particularly in uh, fungal infections. If there is a suspicion, then leak scraping can be done, uh, uh, particularly in atypical mycobacteria or parasitic infections. In patients with re recalcitrant ulcers, with a strong suspicion of rare organisms such as pythium, it's important that we plan for early keratoplasty, early therapeutic keratoplasty, and this keratoplasty specimen can be sent for microbiological workup as well as for uh, histopathology workup. So in non-responsive ulcers, as well as in uh, ulcers which are going towards the limbus, early corneal uh, transplantation or uh, corneal transplantation should be uh, done uh, as early as possible. So once again, I'd like to repeat the side that corneal scraping is perhaps the most valuable specimen in case of corneal ulcer. An examination is a mainstay in the diagnosis and subsequent management. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mohan, uh, uh, for a good overview of uh, corneal scraping. We now move on to the next talk, which will be given by Professor Namrata Sharma, and she will be talking about redefining how we treat bacterial keratitis. Dr. Sharma. Thank you, uh, Prashant. Uh, I would be talking to you about how we redefine uh, bacterial keratitis. And I would just share my screen. I think a little bit may be a repetition of what already has been talked about. So I think. Uh, Every uh, few uh, months or few years, you can say we have to redefine how we treat a case of, in fact, microbial keratitis, uh, because uh, the, the things keep changing over a period of time. There are no financial interests or disclosures. And once you've diagnosed a case of microbial keratitis, which could be on the basis of symptoms as well as on the basis of uh, signs, and one has already identified a risk factor uh, which may be there, which could be ocular or which could be systemic, 
it is important to uh, measure the size of the ulcer the depth of the ulcer the size of the epithelial defect stromal edema scleral involvement all the parameters so that you know whether your ulcer is healing or not and very important like i always emphasize is the size of the ulcer because that would determine your treatment not only in cases of uh, bacterial keratitis but in other cases of microbial keratitis as well now sometimes you can pick up the ulcers as is shown here just by looking at the pictures which of course is not a good thing to do but uh, nevertheless uh, just so that your clinical suspicion clinches on a particular diagnosis staph aureus with localized distinct margins and pneumococcus which is serpiginous ulcer with deep stromal infiltrates and pseudomonas with a greenish discharge which is classical and then you have mycobacterial ulcers uh, which have cracked windshield classical cracked windshield appearance and these are the organisms which can actually uh, uh, trick you because if you are treating ulcers uh, thinking that they are common organisms and they turn out to be atypical then it kind of gets tricky and likewise again those which we don't suspect like morexella or nocardia which we only suspect if the uh, antimicrobial therapy is not uh, uh, if the uh, patient is not responding to the conventional antimicrobial therapy so classical inferior ulcers with morexella and nocardia with the indolent elevated hyphate edges with cracked windshield appearance and these were two papers which again reemphasize the fact that very difficult to pick up ulcers when you look at them clinically even by the uh, cornea specialists and only 3/4 of the times they were able to pick it up now after you've done a good scrape you've stained them and you've put them on a culture media which could be blood agar chocolate agar or subroth dextrose agar and other supplemental media you would think when uh, you have recalcitrant cases such as anaerobic blood agar for propionobacteria lj for mycobacteria nucardia and uh, non nutrient agar with e coli uh, for acanthamoeba now i think uh, dr sujata has very beautifully uh, covered the entire corneal scraping uh, where it is important to emphasize again that everything which is related to the uh, infection has to be sent for culture sensitivity it could be a suture it could be a specimen following dalk it could be a specimen of penetrating keratoplasty and corneal biopsy i think is underutilized and we do not uh, you know give it much importance but has a very important role to play especially in recalcitrant cases of uh, microbial keratitis which are not responding the treatment strat strategies we are all aware of depending upon the geographical location either it is a combination therapy of kefazolin tobramycin or kefazolin ciprofloxacin as is used more frequently in south india for moderate ulcers which are large and which involve the visual axis but for mild ulcers one can uh, uh, use fluoroquinolones and i think what we need to identify is where this levofloxs 1.5% would feature in whether it would also feature in for uh, for moderate ulcers or will it substitute combination therapy or not in cases of moderate to severe ulcers is something that we need to see then uh, treatment regime initially is with the loading dose round the clock and then uh, subsequently uh, the word taper is in fact not good because the the antibiotic should never be tapered they should be stop flush and uh, this is just to say that frequent dose of antibiotics is necessary for sterilization phase as well as during the healing phase these were two studies that we published where we did show in rcts that in mild cases uh, fluoroquinolones did as well as uh, uh, the combination therapy but these were the studies which were done in uh, 2013 and 2016 which was almost 4 years ago in fact this study on 2016 was done much earlier published a little later so you can say the entire uh, data here is of 5 years ago and things change as uh, as the with the changing times now uh, kefazolin and tobramycin have to be prepared in the pharmacy which again is not a proposition which is available to all and sterility issues are also there likewise vancomycin is something which we all reserved and we start did start using when in, in between kefazolin was uh, powder was dis discontinued and we were not able to get it but again the problem with this is that if you use it too much then this is been kept as a last resort 
and people will start developing resistance to this as well i do believe that adjunctive therapy has a role to play and uh, so do topical corticosteroids they do decrease inflammation but they have to be used very very cautiously systemic antibiotics although people do give but possibly and probably do not have a role in cases of bacterial keratitis and this was the scut trial which did show that early use of topical steroids is beneficial in cases of low vision cases which are central ulcers which are deep ulcers non nacardia keratitis and severe pseudomonas pseudomonas keratitis but of course to be used with caution so scut trial did teach us that you can start topical steroids provided you've given loading dose of antibiotics for 48 hours and again the question is which loading dose of antibiotics no point giving antibiotics to which the organism is already resistant and you should have culture insensitivity report in hand and never used for nocardia atypical mycobacteria keratitis and fungal keratitis now of course if the ulcer responds well and good if it does not then besides resistance there are other issues which also one needs to look at which could be compliance and i think for us severe cases we tend to uh, admit in our wards i'm sure even at lv prasad or other tertiary care centers also this is followed and other organisms and other factors play an important role which are often overlooked and modify antibiotics only if there is no clinical improvement and change nothing whatever your culture sensitivity is if there is a clinical improvement which is there and of course uh, this has again been covered uh, professor radhika covered this on what specific antibiotics to use for what specific organisms and these can be only guidelines because uh, if there is resistance to these then again you have to look for other antibiotics uh, this is the ao recommendation from 2018 and look at the way the antibiotic resistance is going on increasing exponentially it's a exponential curve if you look at the pubmed and this will uh, continue to do so more so in the re recent years and uh, armor study was very nicely highlighted i think by dr prashant over the resistance so we have to look for newer combinations newer formulations newer drugs which could be uh, in the form of uh, piperacillin people have tried lenozolid colistin imipenem uh, and uh, even uh, vancomycin but of course uh, this is something which uh, we should keep it reserved now levoflox 1.5% has come uh, in the market which Uh, people are trying now and levoflox unims i believe are also available uh, which i think are not available in india so that is something which we need to look at and these are the concentrations uh, for various organisms that lenozolid has been tried for gram positive bacteria colistin for multiple drug resistant pseudomonas and imipenem for multiple drug resistant gram negative bacteria nocardia and non tuberculous mycobacteria no again a uh, topical colistin would need to be prepared uh, and there are not large scale trials or uh, large case series also of topical colistin to say that it works uh, anecdotal reports and case series with very few patients are available then topical piperacillin and tazobactam combination has been tried for recalcitrant pseudomonas aeruginosa keratitis i didn't catch that and uh, again uh, sub inhibitory concentration of piperacillin and tazobact also on pseudomonas aeruginosa in animal models and again one needs to see how this will translate into uh, uh, human studies uh, and it is important to prevent resistance and i think uh, much has been said about it that you have to use the right kind of antibiotic rapid tests are required so that uh, you can choose your antibiotics ju judiciously do not taper antibiotics but stop at the therapeutic doses and uh, uh, using very low dose or sub therapeutic dose or too shorter duration of antimicrobial use can increase the antimicrobial resistance and this is how uh, your uh, treatment of a corneal ulcer should be but the second thing that needs to be looked at is the inflammation so you have infection versus the inflammation inflammation would lead to the formation of the corneal scar and once once the ulcer starts healing then you have to uh, devise remedies and ways to decrease inflammation and to decrease scarring and that i think is a territory which is completely uh, uncharted and also one needs to look at that so uh, there have been people have given vitamin c doxycycline etc etc to decrease the collagenolysis 
to decrease the corneal irregularity, to decrease the corneal scar, and to uh, decrease the chances of perforation. But there are no long-term studies again to show uh, what is the role of uh, exact role of these, or whether they do have any role, or whether there are other molecules which need to be looked into uh, to prevent inflammation. You can have problems like this where it goes into sequelae and complications uh, such as this, and then you may need to glue them or give do patch grafts, uh, which may have some kind of antimicrobial uh, properties as well. The cyanocrylate uh, glue does have it, and uh, these are large. This is a large case of ulcer which was uh, glued and also responded to therapy, but nevertheless the antimicrobial therapy cannot stop. It has to continue. And of course, uh, one can even do DALC in these cases. You do get a tissue uh, which is available to you and uh, for bacterial keratitis, DALC may have an important role to play, not, not for fungal keratitis because fungus tends to penetrate deep and uh, it does give good results uh, with a single stage visual rehabilitation as well as uh, 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 amelioration of the uh, keratitis process. But if you have a case like this, post-epilessic keratitis resistant to everything, impending perforation, and uh, 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 came out to be Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and it was only responsive to uh, amipenem. So amipenem do drops have to be prepared because then in these cases, the problem is not of the surgical, uh, uh, surgical therapy or surgical excision of the antimicrobial uh, of the microbial load that you would do uh, with a therapeutic penetrating keratoplasty such as this, but also the fact that there should be no recurrence post-op. And then uh, like in this case, the therapeutic penetrating keratoplasty was done followed by the amipenem drops which are given post-operatively because it was only sensitive to that drug and resistant to uh, everything else. So uh, this of course, uh, finally a uh, optical penetrating keratoplasty was done for this case for visual rehabilitation. And like I said, this is yet another problem when you do a therapeutic penetrating keratoplasty and the infection recurs. And if it is resistant to everything, then you do not know how to deal with it. So uh, this again uh, becomes a problem. Uh, brief about the uh, packed CXL or role of collagen crosslinking in microbial keratitis. And although uh, there have been reviews and meta-analysis, but there are no large term high quality randomized control trials to fully ascertain the therapeutic effect of packed CXL. And uh, I think more RCTs with greater number of patients is required uh, because uh, in the current times, uh, there are only four randomized control trials uh, which are available. And this was a Cochrane uh, review of meta-analysis which had two RCTs and one quasi RCT up till 2019. Uh, but there are five ongoing randomized control trials which are enrolling 1136 participants, which may provide better answers, more so in bacterial keratitis. Um, fungal keratitis, the results have not been very good and have been quite uh, dismal. So again, uh, this is uh, the uh, review article on PACT CXL uh, microbial keratitis. So I think we do need to rewind, reevaluate, and redefine our approaches in terms of drug resistance about which much has been talked about and highlighted uh, in terms of microbiology, culture sensitivity and suspicion. There are no new drugs available, but combination, newer combinations, newer formulations, newer concentrations, alternate routes is something what we need to look at. Then visual outcomes again need to be looked at because you, have, you probably have to be more aggressive in the use of anti-collagenolytics and anti-inflammatory therapy to decrease the scar. And of course, monitoring is required. I think that is something which we lack here is the regular audit of ulcer cases and redefining protocols. So thank you very much for your kind attention. Thanks, Namrata, for a wonderful overview of uh, the treatment of bacterial corneal ulcer. <clears throat> we now will move on to the next talk, which will be given by Professor which will be given by Professor Kinoshita. The title of the talk is Promise of High Concentration Levofloxacin in 1.5%. Bhushan, are you starting the... Uh, 
All right. Uh, thank you very much for including me uh, as a, one of the speaker of this combating an antibiotic resistance with high concentration level fluoxacin. I will talk a bit of a higher concentration of the level fluoxacin you called Oftakix 1.5%. My name is Shigeru Kinoshita uh, from Kyoto, Japan. Well, there are three key uh, principles of ocular infection treatment, early intervention and broad antibacterial spectrum and hit bacteria properly and strongly. So these are the key. Well, bacteria is uh, like a time bomb. Uh, within um, the one day, uh, 24 hours, they will multiply up to uh, like a 200 million, just started from one box. So we, when we are talking or thinking about ocular surface infection, I myself will divide into two uh, major categories. One is a commensal bacteria, uh, including Staphylococcus uh, species or Streptococcus and Enterococcus fecaris and so on. And the other uh, group is environmental bacteria, such as Pseudomonas aeruginosa and Selatia species. These two are making the corneal infection. Well, these are the four major uh, corneal infections. Gram-positive staph aureus, streptococcus pneumoniae, and this is Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and this is Moraxella. So uh, all these four uh, have a, a bit different uh, ocular surface manifestation at early phase already. When we uh, had a national survey uh, many years ago in Japan, uh, corneal infection has two peaks of age, at least in Japan, with or without contact lens usage. Uh, around 20s to 30s, there's one peak in a younger age, and the other is the 60s. Contact lens-related infection is dominant under the 30s uh, years of age. One, uh, you could uh, treat the contact lens uh, uh, corneal infection uh, very easily with the use of the, some of the antimicrobial agent, but some of them are very severe corneal infection occurred. What kind of bugs or the organism is related? One is a Pseudomonas aeruginosa, the other is Acanthamoeba. Once again, we uh, Japanese uh, our, our corneal uh, the, uh, surgeons had a, a national survey at that time. Uh, these two are the key for the difficult to treat. Both of them are related to the environmental pathogens, not the commensal bacteria. Well. This is the, uh, I cited from the A6 uh, microorganism distribution by country by country. You could see, uh, since I belong to uh, Japan, uh, we have more uh, gram-positive bacteria, uh, I would say, uh, I think, uh, somewhat uh, related to the coronary infection. But the other uh, South Asian countries, they have uh, more uh, of the gram-negative bacteria. And also in India, you have have many gram-negative bacteria corner infection as well. Well, we are targeting staff aureus because in, in Japan there are uh, senior persons and also uh, the, there's some of the trauma or the, 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 the long use of the steroid eye drops and uh, the senior persons, they are kind of a compromised host. So uh, we have more stuff aureus, especially MLSA. But also we have a uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa as well. So these are closely, uh, co I would say, related uh, to the, the use of the soft contact lens, especially two weeks soft contact lens. Well, uh, back to the uh, quinolones. Uh, the, in Japan, uh, the Santen Pharmaceutical Company released the Kravit, so-called the name Kravit Ophthalmic Solution, 0.5% 20 years ago. And then 10 years later, they uh, developed the Ophthalmic Solution Kravit 1.5% release. So we have about a 10 years experience of the use of the 1.5% level fluoxacin uh, eye drops. 
What's a fluoroquinolones? You've already uh, know that broad spectrum antimicrobial reagent, and uh, the key is a concentration dependent bactericidal activities. And they are uh, bind and inhibit DNA gyrus and the topo isomelase 4. This is all you've already understand that. But this one slide is a key for the understanding of the uh, level, the effectiveness of the level for accessing. There are two types of the antimicrobial agent. One is a concentration dependent, the other is a time dependent. The, the probably the, the famous uh, the drugs of the time dependent is a vancomycin. Well, neoquinolone belongs to the concentration dependence. What's a concentration dependent? Concentration dependent antimicrobial uh, 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 the, uh, drugs, are the higher the Cmax or the greater the AUC, the more effective uh, concentration dependent antimicrobials are. So that there's a key three, uh, I, I would say, uh, the, the terms, Cmax, MIC, and AUC. Time-dependent antimicrobial agent, uh, on the other hand, they are the longer the time above MIC, the more effective time-dependent antimicrobials are. So once again, Cmax is a key, uh, and also AUC is a key uh, for the new quinolones. Well, they both, uh, they, uh, I would say, inhibit the DNA gyrus and also the topo isomelase 4. Let's look at the, uh, the, these, uh, the first generation, second generation, and the third generation of the quinolones, and fourth generation of the quinolones. Third generation of the quinolones does not, does not, it does not mean that that is weaker or that that is, is not so effective than the fourth generation. For instance, I would like to show you, uh, this is the very important uh, uh, the data uh, released uh, in Japan, Begamox Ophthalmic Solution interview form. This is official interview form released in Japan. Please take a look at the pseudo uh, uh, monas auginosa, uh, the sensitivity, MIC. You could see moxifloxacin and levofloxacin. Levofloxacin is far sensitive to the pseudomonas aeruginosa in terms of the uh, MIC of the pseudomonas aeruginosa. There's another uh, report, uh, uh, I think a release uh, from the other uh, elsewhere. Label is once again sensitive than uh, the moxifloxacin. Uh, the label is sensitive than moxy. And also, uh, this is a kind of a comparative study of the penetration in rabbits after topical menstruation uh, because the, uh, this is anterior chamber concentration in rabbits, single dose uh, unit of uh, the use. You could see uh, this is moxie and this is 1.5% uh, rebel. This is 0.5% rebel and the other quinolones. Uh, um, uh, I would say moxie and the label, uh, there's almost equal or uh, this area and the label is higher uh, concentration in the anterior chamber. So therefore 1.5% has a very uh, meaningful things. 1.5% uh, the kurabit, this is the, um, you called off the quicks. So uh, this is the concentration is almost the same as the uh, moxifloxacin. And also off the quicks is more sensitive uh, uh, to the pseudomonas aeruginosa. Well, I'd like to show you uh, several uh, examples. Pseudomonas day zero, uh, severe eye pain, pifola, fever, and uh, uh, you could see that, and uh, you could say the uh, the off the quicks 1.5 percent every 30 minutes. Day one, they already have a very good response, and then uh, uh, becoming the uh, I would say the uh, the the improvement 
a very good improvement of the ocular surface. So this is another case of the Pseudomonas, very early stage, day zero. We found it, uh, this is a Pseudomonas, and then uh, you could see after the one month of the treatment by the label for in 1.5%, cornea is almost uh, become transparent. So this is the another case you could see usually uh, how to use the after kicks 1.5%. Uh, 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 day zero every 30 minutes, uh, followed by the every one hour for the next couple of days or so. And from the day four to seven, every uh, two to three hours. So that means six times per day. And then one week after the initial treatment, we uh, uh, I would say we uh, use four times per day or so. So this is a typical our standard uh, protocol of the use of the level of rocksacin. Day zero, day three, Day seven, once again, this is a pseudomonas arugnosa. Of course, uh, the uh, rebofloxacin is effective to the other type of the, the bacteria, such as the uh, um, uh, stuff aureus as well. Well, this is once again, day zero. Uh, this is a contact lens users, color contact lens users. Left eye is okay, but not right eye. Quite right eye has already had a coronary infection and then day two and day 26. Well, uh, if we see the severe case of the coronary infection, we almost always use the Arebo 1.5% as the first choice in Japan. Well, I'd like to show you uh, the, some of the data, clinical efficacy and safety, and also penetration and PK data, and broad spectrum of the bacterial coverage, including pseudomonas species of the level 1.5% called Ofta quicks in India. Well, this is a peak concentration of the level 1.5% generally higher than three other fluoroquinolone, including gachi, moxi, uh, or so. And this is a cornea, this is a acus humor, and this is anterior vitreous. And also the peak concentration of the level 1.5% were higher than, once again, three other fluoroquinolones in uh, key ocular tissue of the labitis on single use and repeat instillation. You could see once again, the uh, Rebo is higher. Rebo is higher than the other uh, quinolones. Well, this is a very interesting uh, studies, uh, uh, I think, performed uh, in uh, Europe. Uh, this is uh, before the cataract surgery. Uh, they are randomized that the patient and the patient use either the level of fluoxacin 1.5% four times daily or moxifloxacin 0.5% four times daily. And then uh, day four, uh, at the time of the surgery, uh, just immediately before the cataract surgery, uh, aspirate the uh, correct the acus humor and to see the concentration of the uh, uh, acus uh, humor. So, and then a significant, there's a significant difference in favor with the level of roxacin, uh 1.5% uh, in a mean acus humor uh, drug concentration over time uh, with a moxifloxacin. You could see uh, one hour, two hours, four, six hours before uh, in an acus humor. Well, this is a kind of clinical response of the level of roxacin uh, to the uh, uh, many uh, different uh, kinds of the bugs or so, gram positive, gram negative, and anaerobic bacteria. 100% response and very effective in most of the, most of the bacteria you could see. <laughs> Well, and then uh, what about the uh, adverse uh, reaction? Uh, 
Adverse reaction, this is also the sensitive because the 1.5% of the rebel frog sassing, you may think this is uh, uh, too much. Um, they may uh, produce the, some of the corneal epithelial or corneal endothelial uh, damage or so. So therefore, uh, we uh, uh, had a subjective, uh, the symptom first. So uh, eye irritation, eye uh, prurias, dysgagia, urticaria, there's a sum, but uh, uh, five out of 238 patients, uh, uh, that is 2.1%. And uh, uh, I think this is phase three clinical trial data. Very minimal. And then uh, this is uh, the wide spectrum of the antibacterial coverage. Rebo covered uh, most of the negative, gram negative, Gram positive and anaerobic, and including Pseudomonas aeruginosa, but not moxifloxacin. Moxi does not include the, the effectiveness of the Pseudomonas aeruginosa or so. And the cytotoxicity profile. One more time, I'd like to show you uh, this data. Cytotoxicity in culture, cultured corneal endothelial cell. That is lowest among among the other uh, new quinolones. So, so therefore, effects of the four quinolone on wound healing, this is wound healing in corneal endothelial cells. Uh, we would say that uh, this is a less uh, adverse effect uh, of the cytotoxicity uh, uh, in, on the level of roxacin uh, than the others. So this is, uh, once again, cytotoxicity in cultured corneal FTL cells cultured corneal and epithelial cells, but uh, effects on corneal epithelial cell and calcite proliferation. So the, the, the experiment is a bit different, but this could say the level, once again, uh, is the lowest uh, cytotoxicity uh, as compared uh, to the three other fluoroquinolones. Well, once again, please take a look at the, this, uh, the picture. The day zero, this is once again Pseudomonas aeruginosa. I'd like to use the, this uh, ocular uh, surface at uh, the picture because the Pseudomonas is the most difficult to treat, at least for the, our, the corneal uh, specialists. So therefore, but not only for the Pseudomonas, all the other type of the, uh, the different kind of the bugs, the, the rebel is very sensitive. Uh, uh, to uh, that treat them. Day zero and day 11. You could see uh, the, 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 the cornea, these cornea uh, uh, is healed, although there are some of the still the FTR defect, but the corneal infection site is already uh, managed quite properly. And then the visual acuity improved significantly. So this is one of uh, the last slide for me. Uh, I haven't talked about uh, endophthalmitis or the treatment of the endo endophthalmitis. Uh, there are two types of the endophthalmitis, uh, I would say the bugs related to the endophthalmitis. One is a commensal bacteria, including once again, uh, as I mentioned to you earlier, staph aureus, streptococcus pneumonia, enterococcus fecaris. Uh, these are the three uh, major uh, category of the bugs. But the other part is environmental bacteria. Pseudomonas aeruginosa was selatia. If the, there's a, some of the end of time it might so occurred uh, uh, caused by Pseudomonas aeruginosa, the eye is already gone. So uh, we are very, very careful about uh, the which kind of uh, the topical uh, the uh, antimicrobial agent used for the prophylaxis. We use the uh, level of fluoxacin 1.5%, generally speaking, in Japan. So uh, once again, uh, thank you very much uh, for your kind attention. Thank you, Professor Kinoshita. Uh, uh, the next uh, talk, uh, Prashant, yeah, Manamrita, go ahead. Can we play the sponsor's video right now? Then we can take it. Yeah, them. yeah, yeah.
The, uh, first of all, thank you, Dr. Kinoshita, for a wonderful overview of levofloxacin in 1.5%. Uh, now we have Dr. Nikhil Gokhale from Mumbai, who will be talking about his own experience with levofloxacin in 1.5%. Uh, Nikhil, over to you. Thank you, Prashant. Uh, so basically, as we are aware and we heard that uh, we can use this drug for uh, prophylaxis uh, as well as for treatment of uh, serious corneal infections. Now, when we actually look at uh, how we should be treating corneal infections, we know that uh, after we examine the patient, we normally start empirically uh, treatment based on our clinical judgment. Uh, very soon, usually within a few hours, we would have a smear report, which might help us to modify our treatment. Uh, we then monitor the patient and then based on the culture reports, we may further modify our treatment if necessary. So this is the ideal flow that we all would like to follow when we have a patient with corneal ulcer. However, there is a lot of difference in the way we practice. For example, a lot of general ophthalmologists will only treat patients based on clinical judgment and empirical treatment rather than doing any sort of microbiology. Some of us, uh, including corneal surgeons who are in smaller setups, may have uh, access to doing smear testing. They may not have reliable uh, culture facilities, so we might treat based on clinical judgment and smears. And then some of us who are in tertiary care centers, referral centers, have access to all modalities of investigation and would treat probably more ideally than some of the others. <clears throat> So I thought I will just share with you one case which I recently treated uh, with levofloxacin. So this was a patient who had a failed graft and he was still putting uh, steroid drops in the eye. And he came suddenly with a big abscess involving a large area of the graft as you can see. Clinically it looked bacterial. I suspected that this could be gram negative infection. So we sent the corneal scraping for microbiology and uh, we started him on uh, levofloxacin drops along with other supportive therapy. The smears were showing gram-negative uh, bacilli, so we continued the treatment. As you can see, within three days, there was a considerable resolution of the corneal infection. However, there was a lot of anterior chamber exudation, which I feel was probably a lot of inflammation due to steroid withdrawal as well. The cultures by this time were showing Pseudomonas aeruginosa. You can see five days later, the inflammation is persistent, but the infective component and the anterior chamber exudation had significantly reduced. So when we saw the microbiology report, actually the uh, MIC level was lowest to levofloxacin, which was less than 0.12 microgram per ml, followed by ciprofloxacin and meropenem. And in fact, they were a little higher for the aminoglycosides, which we otherwise uh, normally use in some of these gram-negative infections. So looking at the microbiology report, and of course, based on the patient's clinical improvement, we continued the drops and the patient uh, has improved very well and uh, is recovering fast and there is complete resolution. When we look at what general ophthalmologists follow is that when they see a patient with corneal ulcer, they normally use broad spectrum antibiotics that do not need preparation. However much we may try to show uh, the need for uh, prepared drops. It is not very convenient and uh, probably patient uh, doctors in busy practice do not like to prepare drops. So they would like to prescribe whatever is available commercially. Most of them may not do microbiology. Some of them do microbiology, but I often find that they are inconclusive or the laboratory reports are not very reliable and uh, the picture is often confusing. And if the patient really doesn't improve, they try a bit of trial and error and then finally the patient is referred to a higher center where proper facilities are available. Now we 
all know that the we have options of using a commercially available drug for corneal infections and among these drugs we know that fluoroquinolone is the one which is the drug of choice when we look at uh, monotherapy with a commercially available antibiotic uh because of course they have advantages that uh, they are stable they don't need preparation they have broad spectrum coverage however there are significant gaps when you look at uh, methicillin uh, resistant staphylococcus or maybe multi drug resistant pseudomonas however as we saw today some of these higher concentration antibiotics can bridge the gap because they reach very high levels which may be exceeding the uh, you know concentrations which are normally achievable in the serum uh, to label them as resistant of course traditionally or as corneal surgeons we always would prefer uh, to use fluoroquinolones for small or peripheral ulcers and then uh, use the more potent combination of uh, antibiotics for very large deep central ulcers and so on however when we look from the angle of a general ophthalmologist who is not going to prepare a fortified antibiotic uh, in that case then we have to focus on what would be the best fluoroquinolone as monotherapy uh, given the various options that we have which are available so when we look at an ideal antibiotic i think among the various fluoroquinolones we know that uh, the levoflux is now available at the highest concentration and because the fluoroquinolones are concentration dependent bactericidal agents they can achieve very high levels in the ocular tissues and as a result they can overcome the resistance which is there for some of the bacteria uh, to these drugs and of course they can uh, they are fairly well tolerated and are preservative free so i think if you have a choice of uh, among the various fluoroquinolones and you want to try monotherapy for a bacterial keratitis i think today probably it's wiser to use a higher concentration drug which is fairly broad spectrum and i think levofloxacin fits the uh, bill in this uh, sort of situation the other area where one can use these drugs may be for cataract surgery uh, in my practice for routine cataract surgery i still uh, usually use uh, fluoroquinolones uh, maybe uh, moxifloxacin however when i see or i have significant number of cases where i operate where they they have other risk factors for uh, uh, ocular surface disease for example like i see patients who have uh, severe dry eye uh or patients who have had uh, my own cases where i have done a corneal graft and the patient now requires a cataract surgery uh some of these patients who may be on chronic topical steroids uh i also have cases where they have systemic immunosuppression going on either because of a uh, rheumatoid or a cicatricial pemphigoid or these type of conditions which probably we see more often in our ocular surface practice or in cornea practice so we have operate significant number of eyes which are sick on the ocular surface have been using drops repeatedly and similarly we have patients who have used a lot of uh, taken a lot of injections for uh, retina problems who may be having more resistance on the ocular surface so in these situations we might uh, expect more resistant organisms we might expect uh, colonization which may be higher than normal and some of these problems with tear film disorders we may not have adequate immune uh, resistance on the ocular surface because the tear film uh, is abnormal and uh, because of lid margin and other problems there may be a higher risk of uh, organisms like t acne so in some of these situations i use and i prefer to use uh, now that it is available 1.5% levoflux so i normally give four times a day three days before surgery and then add on about three times every 15 to 20 minutes about an hour or two hours before surgery and i continue it four times a day for about 7 to 10 days after surgery and then i stop it so the issue is does it help so unless one does really a comparative study no one can uh, make a judgment however in your mind you know that you have tried whatever best is available and uh, probably gives you a more peaceful sleep 
so i'd like to thank all of you a very great uh, and a happy new year and i hope we overcome covid with immunization now coming in and i would like to say that uh, the message for general ophthalmologists may be that if you're looking at uh, gram negative infections or you're looking at corneal infections where you have to start empirical therapy use the most potent fluoroquinolone which we have in the market today and probably if the patient is still not better do refer them in time so that uh, others can take over and uh, give better uh, management thank you uh, thank you nikhil uh, namrata are you there yeah hi yeah, yeah. So I think uh, we have one question, uh, Dr. Kinoshita. Yes. Uh, and that is, uh, would liver fluxus in 1.5% be better than cefexime to combat ocular infections? How does liver flux compare with uh, cefexime or cefexime, I think that is what we mean. Cipro, cipro uh, we don't use the cipro uh, in Japan. So, uh, but uh, I think uh, I, I, I could say that some of the experience uh, uh, of the use uh, between the mo uh, Moxi, Wagati. And uh, initially when uh, I start using the 1.5% uh, level, at that time, um, I thought that is too much of the concentration. And I'm so worried about uh, some kind of cytotoxicity of that 1.5% uh, or so. Uh, but uh, it turned out to be uh, when we use the like uh, a label 1.5% for the corneal infection, I do not, I do not see not much of the severe cytotoxicity, surprisingly enough. So, and then I, I feel safe enough to use a label 1.5%. And uh, as I mentioned to you, I'm always, we are always uh, um, thinking of the, the possible coronary infection of the pseudomonas infection. Once you see the pseudomonas infection, and if you apply the MOXI, MOXI does not have any effect to the pseudomonas erinosa. So, so therefore, uh, it's in danger uh, to use some of the coronary infection, especially in a younger generation. So therefore, we not only myself, uh, the we Japanese, most of them, we switched from the MOXI uh, to the level 1.5% because that is high enough, uh, I think a C max uh, at the time of the use. And then uh, that is, if the, that is a pseudomonas, that is effective. And once you got the result that that is like a gram positive and that, that is stuff or also, so you may switch uh, to the level, uh, to the, uh, the MOXI. Uh, uh, later on. So that also, of course, you, you could continue to use a level 1.5% level for oxacin. So I think uh, generally speaking, it's safe enough to use a 1.5% level for oxacin, I, uh, I think eye drops, but you, you should not use for a long term period, like one month, two months. And so that, that is, that is uh, I think uh, you should not do that. Do you think it's okay for the question? Yeah, yeah, perfectly all right. I think uh, Dr. Kinoshita, you covered it very well. The mm. because the concentration is higher, mm. there is always mm. a uh, always a fear. Is it more epitheliotoxic? Is it more mm. endotheliotoxic? I think in mm. your talk you very nicely clarified mm. that uh, you know it is not epitheliotoxic and it is mm. not endotheliotoxic mm. as well. Mm. Nikhil, I think you very nicely highlighted. But in cases of conjunctivitis, would you like to use it? Bacterial conjunctivitis. Uh, myself? Yeah, Dr. King. Oh, uh, yes, yes, yes. We we do. Uh, also, the uh, the some of the, the the clinical trial also proved the effectiveness of the 1.5% level uh, for the bacterial conjunctivitis tivitis as well. Yes. So, Prashant, would you use it for conjunctivitis cases or would you? So, yeah, so since the the other formulation that uh, are available are 0.5% and by uh, conjunctival concentration can be achieved very well with those lower dose. Uh, mm. I think at this point of time, uh, we will prefer to use a, mm. a lower concentration drug mm. for conjunctival. Mm -hmm. The other fear that we have in India is that 
uh, uh, to a great extent, the conjunctivitis in India is adenoviral conjunctivitis. And if uh-huh. you use higher concentration drugs and antibiotic, my worry is that it will be misused and may mm-hmm. enhance the toxicity in patients of adenoviral conjunctivitis. Yeah, yeah, I understand that, yeah. I would also say that if you have conjunctivitis, I even in fact try and avoid using uh, say moxiflox or gatiflox even because as Prashant said, if you're using prophylactic for a viral or if you even if you have bacteria, sometimes I'm more uh, in favor of using a drug which we normally like oprocessin or chloramphenicol, which you're not going to use in a routine, uh, you know, armamentarium for serious cases. So I think we must restrict use of higher generation of chloroquinolones for, uh, you know, prophylactic uh, or for just a red eye where we don't know what exactly is going on, you know, because that is, and because once one ophthalmologist prescribes the general practitioners in the community also start prescribing the same drug. And I think then we have more problems. So you, you said you would use it, you know, Nikhil in cases of say ocular surface disease with the if you see, you might use in those cases uh, prophylactically also. So uh, I think uh, there is a suggestion which is coming up that most of the times higher generation is considered as the best antibiotic. And what we should look for is when choosing. So would you go in, the, the question is also whether, would you go in for a higher generation fluoroquinolone? I mean, how would you compare moxiflox or gatiflox 0.5%, which is uh, a higher generation vis-a-vis a concentration, which is higher, but a lower generation. I think we need to see the spectrum uh, as well as the concentration. I think just going by whether it's third or fourth generation really may not be making so much of a difference. It's not necessary that uh, the fourth generation is better than third generation or the third is better than fourth. But I think the higher concentration probably makes a lot of difference. And the coverage, as Dr. Kinoshita showed in his lecture, uh, that the coverage is fairly broad spectrum. So I believe that patients where there is a higher risk of, uh, you know, getting uh, infection post-surgically, maybe if you use a higher concentration, which is having as good as a spectrum as a uh, Vigamox or Moxiflox or uh, Gatiflox probably uh, may be better off. But th- that is what I said, it is anecdotal experience. And I think unless somebody does a proper study, it means that what are the infection rates, uh, one can really make a scientific comment on that. Uh, Prashant, what is your take on the yeah, so I think what, versus concentration? Yeah, no, so what, what I will say is that as far as the prophylaxis for routine case, which is not having any high risk feature, we can use any antibiotic mm-hmm. which has a broad spectrum of activity, uh, probably following the principle of antibiotic recycling. We can we have used moxifloxacin for mm-hmm. a long period of mm-hmm. time. We may go to the mm-hmm. now as the on the other hand, when you are dealing with the cases that Nikhil highlighted, where the risk of infection by drug resistant organism is very high elderly patient, ocular surface diseases, prior graft. Mm. Now, in those high-risk cases, if you are really worried about the risk of endophthalmitis prophylaxis, then probably the drug in the higher concentration will be much more desirable. Mm. We can we can pre-treat these patients for mm. say two, three days with the with the levofloxacin in 1.5% mm. mm. and continue it into the post-operative period till the risk of infection is completely taken care of. So I think that will be my uh, my take as far as where the prophylactic or the value of 1.5% levofloxacin in prophylaxis against endophthalmitis. Mm-hmm. But for routine cases, I'll still say let us reserve this drug for mm-hmm. the treatment of serious mm-hmm. infections rather than mm-hmm. uh, jumping onto the prophylaxis. Mm-hmm. Okay, so Sujata, you would like to give any comment on the on the topic as such? No, you have to unmute. It's a wonderful talk and a very well covered um, uh, webinar. 
The only concern is always, you know, once we start getting a new generation antibiotic, which we have not used before, then there is a lot of enthusiasm and everybody starts prescribing it for even for very ordinary um, uh, infections like conjunctivitis and then the develop, development of resistance and so on. So uh, it's only, I think, uh, very important for them to understand this particular drug is reserved for uh, very important uh, infections where, like uh, Dr. Garg was saying, you know, very uh, difficult cases with ocular surface disorders where you're expecting uh, infections and not uh, use them in a very gentle manner like we have used uh, ciprofloxacin and moxifloxacin mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. Just one more question about the drug is like, what is the um, uh, preservative that these people have on an optoquix? Uh, is there anybody uh, has a knowledge on that uh, sentence preservative? What is the preservative they are using? Preservative. Yes. Concentrations of smoke or preservative. This is also preservative free, is it? Yeah. Yes. Doctor Quick is also preservative. Yeah. Yeah. That's preservative free. In in Japan, Doctor Kinoshida, it's a with preservative or without preservative? I I think that that's a preservative. That the some of the preservative, oh, yeah. I I believe in Malaysia it's preservative free in UNIMS. Uh, 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 if somebody from Santon can answer that, mm. is it uh, true? Gyan, if you can unmute. I think. Uh, 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 so this is preservative free, and actually mm. across uh, across the globe it is preservative free. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So even in Japan, it is preservative free. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. So there's another question. What would be the ideal guidelines for using prophylactic antibiotics after a procedure like foreign body removal or corneal abrasion? Uh, would you like to give uh, something like a moxiflox or getiflox or levoflox is okay? Again, it is a prophylaxis. So, but probably with the increased propensity for infection because you are breaching the corneal epithelium. So I think, uh, Prashant, would you like to again qualify whether there is a breach in epithelium and whether we can still use it or not? Yeah, so I think there are two beautiful studies done, uh, one in Nepal and another in Madurai, where they used chloramphenicol applicaps and they found that simple use of chloramphenicol applicap after foreign body removal or with corneal abrasion helps prevent not only bacterial infection, but also reduces the risk of fungal infection. Uh -huh. And I think uh, those two studies very clearly document that your role when you prescribe prophylaxis is to not let any organism establish the infection. And, 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 and you, what you are doing is probably preventing biofilm on the surface of cornea by using these antibiotics and promote epithelial healing as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. And toward that, I think we have such cost effective remedies at hand. And mm -hmm. we unfortunately are under utilizing chloramphenicol in our country because of the fear that probably has been documented mostly in Western world. Mm -hmm. I will still go with the prescribing very simple antibiotic in my clinic. I use chloramphenicol. Mm -hmm. I find it least epitheliotoxic mm -hmm. and is helpful in the treatment of corneal abrasion. I will not recommend using higher generation fluoroquinolones for this purpose. Can, because, yeah. you know, uh, ciprofloxacin is probably the cheapest drug uh, antibiotic available. And though it's commonly used by physicians, but just for a foreign body removal, I think ciprofloxacin should do the work, isn't it? The, the, the problem with the ciprofloxacin, if you look now currently, is that um, uh, the cipro, the fluoroquinolones uh, uh, probably have very less gram positive coverage in first generation fluoroquinolone. They are very good with the gram negative. Uh, whether that will be a disadvantage in some scenario, particularly I'm worried about my grafts, which where the infection is most commonly because of gram positive infection. Mm -hmm. I want to mm -hmm. lose an antibiotic that has a good gram positive spectrum. So uh, yes, ciprofloxacin will do well as far as prophylaxis is concerned. Uh, is it cheaper than chloramphenicol? I do not know, but chloramphenicol applicap is available everywhere, right in the mm. rural, uh, masses. So pro that was a reason for me to tell about chloramphenicol, but yes, I agree ciprofloxacin can be one alternative, except mm. on grafts where the gram positive spectrum is a major worry. So all suture removal when I do, 
I prefer to give uh, uh, chloramphenicol. I think uh, I think everybody would agree. We had come out with the AIOS guidelines on corneal ulcer many years back, and it is now time uh, with the newer uh, concentrations, the newer. Uh, drugs, et cetera, to again, relook at them and come out with the uh, uh, renewed guidelines again. So I think this is something which we will work on. Dr. Radhika, would you like to uh, give your comment on the topic that we are, that is being discussed? Uh, I'd like to appreciate this initiative um, because this is a, a point which is, you know, virtually we come across every day because uh, I mean, you're talking about profile access, even as routine surgeries, cataract surgeries, and mm -hmm. uh, in any procedure that you do, uh, you, are, you have to choose a correct antibiotic. Mm -hmm. And then you're, when you're faced with a complicated case, corneal ulcer and uh, trauma. Again, uh, this is a decision that we have to make. So it's, I think, uh, important to uh, have this kind of a discussion and a forum mm -hmm. uh, where everybody has to understand the basic um, uh, the guidelines as well as mm. the concerns. So overall, there's no easy answer, but these principles are very helpful. I must uh, say I really enjoyed everybody's mm. presentation. Mm. Mm. And um, there's a lot of work which is, needs to be done. And even this evidence that we are providing in our own way with all the various studies, it's just adding to the information. Mm. And each person should keep their own track. Um, so many ophthalmologists are getting the scraping done in the culture. They should also give some thought to what are the kind of um, organisms they are growing. And uh, we can even have an alert uh, where you can have a central repository of information of uh, resistance patterns. So mm. these are things mm. which uh, a lot can be done. And uh, I really congratulate uh, AIOS, uh, Professor Shinoki, uh, Shigeru Kinoshita, mm. and mm. Nikhil Prashant, mm. and Sujata. Mm. Mm. Excellent, uh, excellent inputs. Thank you. Mm. Well, thank you. And also, I think can I can I add something like uh, uh, Ladika mentioned about the PKPD theory. That is very important. That is very important. That means the at the time of the surgery, in general, Japanese we do not use an intracameral injection of the antimicrobial agent. So therefore, uh, we would like to uh, add the, some of the eye drops that makes the higher concentration of the antimicrobial agent in AHC. So that means there are the two choice. One is uh, level 1.5% or moxie. So I think these two are the, the uh, choice for the time of the cataract surgery. I think I would say just immediately before or the immediately after. So that's a general concept based upon the PKPD theory. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if there are no questions, there is a link, feedback link, which is there, which is pasted on the Facebook, on the YouTube, as well as in the web portal for everybody to give their feedback on this webinar. So please do spare just one minute. It has very few four or five yeah. questions only to give that so that it helps us to, you know, uh, uh, make these webinars better for future. And I would like to thank uh, everybody for uh, today's webinar, uh, which was very well taken. Uh, Professor Shigeru Kinoshita, our international guest faculty, and the star of the webinar who attracts always huge amount of crowds <laughs> in India. Ever since our postgraduate days, I remember we went you know, to a hotel, I, I still remember correctly, where he had come actually as PG <laughs> students when we were first year PG students because he was there and even Dr. Radhika would remember. <laughs> I can't remember the name of the hotel, but we went running because he was there. So thank you so much, uh, Professor Shigeru Kinoshita for doing this for us today and hope to have your support in future as well. Uh, thank you, um, Professor Radhika Tandon again for an excellent uh, talk, like always. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Sujata Mohan. Excellent inputs, I think, about scraping. It's a small topic, but you really covered almost everything about it. And Nikhil, of course, uh, very nice uh, coverage of the whole thing. Mm. And importantly, questions to answer whether you, we should use it routinely or you know whether we should use it in high-risk cases or in cases uh, where uh, ocular surface disease is there or in graft cases where we are doing grafts. And of course, I can't thank uh, not enough uh, my co-moderator, Dr. Prashant Garg, for uh, 
always be, uh, helping us with these microbial keratitis webinars and other webinars as well. And again, a huge crowd puller uh, for everybody uh, in India as well as uh, abroad uh, has done tremendous amount of work and is a world authority on microbial keratitis. So thank you everyone. Uh, we would like to thank Santan, Mr. Gyan uh, and Mr. Bhushan. Uh, if you can put on your videos, please do put them on because uh, we only you know, do thank you uh, in absentia, only your audios. So thank you for doing this and thank you for helping out with this. And um, the support team, Mr. Kripal Rana from AIOS and Mr. Sunil from uh, uh, ZDO Tech. He has another webinar coming up at 2.30, so he must be preparing for that. Thank you very much, uh, everybody. So that was a schematic diagrams were beautiful. Were beautiful, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think you made them very, very useful. Yeah. So I think we will uh, uh, do a focus group meeting, Prashant. You've already agreed now to do it. So thank you for that. And all the others who will be a part of it to, you know, come out with the guidelines because there are a lot of uh, uh, demand and a lot of members who are asking for it because we did it almost 10 years ago. So it's time to now uh, refresh them again. So thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye.